It has certainly been a volatile month for Tesla shareholders with the surge and the run up to the stock split and then the sell off that followed the company's battery day last week. Shares of Tesla are down roughly 20% this month. Let's bring in Adam Jonas. He is an analyst for Tesla at Morgan Stanley. And Adam, you've got this price target of $272 a share, certainly one of the bearish ones on the market. Um, you've had an equal weight rating though on the stock. So uh, help me square the two here. A pretty bearish call with $272 a share, but still an equal weight. Yeah, I mean, the range of outcomes for Tesla is very wide. Uh, we're kind of gasping for breath as, uh, frankly, the retail investors got this right. I think the long-term software, internet, tech-oriented investor that is comping this company versus a range of other 25 or 30 or 40 or 50 percent kegger companies, that's, that's the lens to use. Um, and we need to see, in order to get our target uh, substantially above where we are today, uh, we have to keep working with our, I kind of need to be a community organizer and keep working with our battery people, our tech and um, internet experts to stay ahead of the curve. And it, it does take industrial kind of crusty folks like myself out of their comfort zone. So look, I, I, our bull case is 527. To get there, I need them to sell about five or six million units a year by 2030. That's about double what we currently forecast. But to go higher than that, and frankly, investors we're talking to, they, they, they want to add a zero to this thing and think that Tesla can be the most valuable company in the world. And to do that, you ain't doing it with cars. You got to go to units times price. You got to go software as a service. You need full autonomy. And those are things we think investors need more evidence of, particularly on autonomy, where we think it's still massively overhyped. We need more evidence there for investors to be compensated. And Adam, I know you've talked about that even before Battery Day last week, but one of the other things that you note here is that Tesla alone can't get there. You've talked about this call to arms to governments, to suppliers, investors, engineering talent. I mean, what specifically are you looking for if you're talking just government policy here, policies here that can be supportive for Tesla? I mean, look, coming out of COVID, governments are left with um, kind of closer to social disorder and unrest, if not act actually seeing it. They're left with potentially structurally higher unemployment or higher for longer. Uh, <clears throat> they're left with a populace that want to see that are seeing our planet be destroyed and they want change. And, and, you know, Elon, it's kind of the right place at the right time in order. He wants to go around the world. I'd follow his tail number. He's going to be talking to governments everywhere. And I think the pitch is, look, I got the smartest people in the world working on chemistry and solar and internet of cars. But for every 10, and I'm in position being a 400 billion gorilla now, I can spend big bucks. But for every 10 billion I spent, I need you spending 100. Let's do business together. I'll bring you jobs and a sustainable future. And you help uh, let me set the hegemony. That's the pitch. It's happened before in other industries and in other centuries. And he, he feels it's his time now. Adam, what does this uh, mean, I guess, as far as investing and looking at Tesla uh, for its battery technologies outside of the auto industry? Is it, is it really just the, the vehicles or is it uh, a broader sense of they'll be able to bring this to bear uh, on uh, you know, electrical infrastructure uh, on an industrial scale for towns and cities? So it kind of, it, it, it starts with autos and that gets them the scale first um, to then be able to get the cost down and then the recycling infrastructure in place to then turn on the grids and do stationary storage, to turn on you know more affordable home storage and then these other alternative uses. But right now, um, the automotive battery pie is more than enough to move the needle. Maybe not enough for them to make their own vehicles. They would need to kind of sell the fifteen or twenty thousand dollar powertrain skateboard, so to speak, to virtually every auto company in the world. That you need something like that to justify the price. But just again, we think. We, again, this company may have arguably the largest TAM in the world at a time when investors are paying an enormous premium for innovation. I would challenge you to find a company that's innovating at a faster, more audacious rate than Elon Musk's company. What we think is being ignored, though, is that the auto industry going forward is not going to be global, in our opinion. There'll be national champs. Tesla and other U.S. OEMs will have to find a solution um, outside of China because they won't be able to compete in the way they are today. You got to make room for the TerraCap companies like the Amazons and Apples, who are also developing batteries and transportation that are co co the real competition, right? 
And then, and then the reality that autonomy might be closer to 20 years away than five. Those are some inconvenient truths that could change, but uh, that's, that's kind of where the, that, 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 that's part of the beef we have with the, what's in the price right now. Adam Ines here. Uh, what do you make of the $25,000 vehicle announcement in three years? Do you see that happening? And how important is this for mass adoption? And do you feel that the pandemic has sort of solidified Tesla's lead when it comes to the EV space against other manufacturers, especially if they can eventually mass produce batteries and then eventually sell them to other companies? Yeah, I mean, Tesla's in a position right now where most OEMs hope to be in five years where Tesla was five years ago you know, roughly a 10 year lead, $25,000 car is important. Now, now look, that might be the starting price. The average price would be 35,000, which is what we've, what we've expected their compact to be, which we don't expect to go um, into production until closer to mid decade. Okay. Maybe they're able to do a couple of years earlier than that, but that's important in order to fill the kind of three terawatt hours of, of supply that they're talking about. If you assume if you assumed half of the three terawatt hour target by 2030 goes to cars and the other half is everything else, recycling, aftermarket, stationary storage, you name it. Um, 1.5 terawatts, that's about 20 million cars. That's about 100% of our current EV forecast globally. Uh, that, that's, a, that's like 25% of all cars sold, maybe 30% of cars sold that year. It's just a massive number. We don't think they're going to get there, frankly, but even if they did half that, they're not going to do it selling $80,000, $100,000 cars. So you got to get the price point down to crack in to the households and to crack into the emerging markets. Adam, you I asked about, to... yeah, oh, please. You asked about the pandemic uh, accelerating Tesla's lead. I think what it's done is it's taken the incumbents and, and, and took their sense of awareness and moved it into urgency. Um, you're seeing how consumers deal with digital, uh, and, and this idea, I think investors are thinking, huh, why am I going to give capital to a company that doesn't have any software talent or really has second, third rate software talent? So Tesla's, you know, areas of expertise, you know, internet of cars, um, AI, ML, d- the vertical integration and the talent that, that seems to be accelerating the market's appreciation of Tesla's position. And then it's, of course, what it's done to the cost of money and the cost of funds is enabling investors to think 20 years out. I regularly talk to investors that have 20, 30-year DCFs on Tesla. I used to take a lot of crap for having a five to 10-year DCF a few years ago. And then we've just been, we've been swamped by investors that are thinking way beyond that now. And Adam, speaking of the long-term timeline here and going back to your earlier um, issue about sort of government policies being supportive, we have that ban coming out of California on gas-powered cars by 2035. I'm just curious if you think that is a sign of things to come if this is just a California specific thing and more pertinent to Tesla, how supportive do you think that will be of Tesla's market overall? It ain't just California. Of course, California is way bigger than that. And by the time we get to 2035, you can imagine all the cities that would have outlawed not just the sale of internal combustion, but the use of internal combustion. I'd say most, if not all major cities in California would have long abolished the use in central business districts. So Listen, we're talking the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, California has 31 million vehicles. There's, and they emit four metric tons of CO2 per second in California. They're in the, the middle of an environmental catastrophe going on with the, with the fires and, 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 and it's raised awareness. So that's on full display. Uh, you're, I think you'll see the other section 177 states, which account for a third of the US light vehicle market to announce similar targets to California, states like States like New York, right? You're going to see them announced. So this is big. It's moving at the pace. It's not moving at the pace of the EPA. It's moving at the pace of cities, states, fleets, tech, and Elon Musk's imagination. And then the kind of quote, quote the, the fear and the greed of Wall Street that's always been there pushing, pushing us forward. Adam, you had mentioned earlier about China being an issue for Tesla and they wouldn't be able to sell there. Can you yeah. kind of give us an idea on that and, and why yeah. that happened? Yeah, let me give you an idea. It's the same. I mean, look, you're seeing it with the tech. You're seeing it with the other names, <laughs> some of the stuff going on right now and data privacy, right? Um, imagine a U.S. How about this? Let me flip the question. Can you imagine a Chinese Internet of Cars autonomous network operating in the streets of Boston in 10 years? Of course not. Wake up. 
It's not happening. And so this idea that the Chinese aren't allowed to use AI network machine learning data privacy networks in the States, but it's okay for us to do there is just a fallacy in our opinion. Um, it's not in step with the national security discussion that we're having with our intelligence community contacts when we talk about AI, cyber, and space. Um, we think that Elon's been invited in, and then he realizes that over time, things will change. It, there could still be an umbilicus where Tesla could own a stake in a listed entity. You, you, your guess is as good as mine in China, but we do think that all U.S. companies, it's not a Tesla-specific issue, will be walled off from knowing where the party is operating in China and where people are going and what they're doing and what their tastes are, just like you don't see that kind of freedom in other IoT and data networks between CINO and U.S. counterparties at this point. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, Adam, that makes sense, but I guess that begs a follow. Does it, does your $272 price target factor in that yeah. to pull back from China? Yeah, it does. We have China sales peaking middle of the decade and then going down um, and uh, X growth by the year 2027 and then a, a steady decline and then eventually nothing after 2030. After 2030. Um, finally, uh, another stock that you cover closely, Virgin Galactic, a big mover in the session today, up more than 20% after BFA and Susquehanna initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating. Uh, how much more upside do you think there is on that stock? Our price target's 24. Um, our, our bull case is, is more or less a double on the stock. I think you got to, when we, when we initiated, you got to take a bit of a biotech type approach to this. Space is hard. Putting humans in space is even harder. Um, there are probabilities that things could go wrong. There's real tech, but I think so, similar to what Tesla's doing, though, they're in a position in a, in a, in a scarce point in the market where you kind of got the SpaceX's and Blue Origins, and they're in that kind of discussion able to bring in capital, uh, a very attractively priced, and talent. And when you do that and you have a lead and you can kind of quasi-monopolize human space tourism for a few, uh, space tourism for a few years, um, there could be some pretty exciting things that happen. So, um, and, then, and then you give yourself that optionality to go into hypersonic point-to-point -point and some of the much larger TAMs, those multi-trillion dollar markets you can disrupt, disrupt. So watch carefully, October 22nd is when the window of their ability to send this first of two man test flights opens up. But I want to make it clear that October 22nd is not a fixed date where they will put the humans in space for a test flight. It's just when a window opens up that may last a few weeks or a couple of months. Okay, we'll be tracking that very closely. Hope to have you back on the show then. Adam Jonas joining us from Morgan Stanley. Great to have you on today. Thank you. Hey investors, Zach Guzman here. Are you interested in learning more about the markets and getting the latest financial news? Well then click right here to subscribe to our Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Get the latest up to the minute market analysis, big interviews in the world of finance and information on how to manage your money every day wherever you are.